this video, we'll take a journey through the evolution of the ball gown, from its origins, its rises and recessions throughout history, as well as where it stands today. We'll talk about how it got its name, who were some of the chief designers that made the silhouettes famous, and what does it take to create a ball gown, as well, again, as its origins. Beginning in the middle of the 15th century, there are marked differences in women's dress. The medieval standard, one-piece tunic, began to be separated from the bodice, creating softer, wider, elongated silhouettes. Improvements in production making the fabrics more affordable. From draped to shaped, soft drape lines began to disappear as the century went on. Women's dress were often separated into two main parts. Bodice and skirt sleeves were often separated too. Full skirts widened and gathered in pleated waistlines. Outer skirts would open up in the front to reveal a petticoat or a forepart underneath. In the 1570s, there was an introduction of the French wheel or farthingale with a stuff rolled around the hips and a hoop with a horizontal stiffeners tied around the waist that makes the skirt stick out from the body. Elegant formality. Between 1560 and 1590, as the century progressed, so the gradual stiffening of women's dress continued. The increasingly rigid garments needed extra support, the beginnings of stays and corsetry. The silhouette stayed triangle with narrow waist ending in sharp points and full skirts. Elizabeth I was the period's notable fashion icon. Female geometry between 1590 and 1625. With the onset of the 17th century, every aspect of women's clothes became highly exaggerated. Fashion history's most ge geometric period created unnatural silhouettes made from straight lines, triangles, and circles. The French farthingale made women the widest and squarest they had ever been. The hems had also been shortened to show up those new high-heeled shoes. These skirts mark France's ascent as Europe's fashion leader. In 1625 to 1635, the silhouettes returned back to a softer skirt design, less full, but not for long. Taffeta and Lace, 1635-1649. There was a relative simplicity about women's dress in the late 1630s and 1640s, with everyday styles consisting of bone bodice and a separate skirt made in soft draping silk such as taffetas and satin. The fashion icon during this time was Henrietta Maria. After the execution of King Charles in 1649, England became a commonwealth with Oliver Cromwell at its head. Cromwell, a Protestant and a Puritan, believed that people should lead pious lives and dress in plain and practical way. Very much contrary to the royalists and the fashions worn in the monarchy, which were more elaborate. From the 1680s, the mantua became the chief item of, of women's dress with a linen smock or shift remaining as the main undergarment. Formal gown. The name mantu may have been derived from the Italian town with the same name, where luxuries and silks were produced or from the French word for coat, manitou. Originally an informal gown that was open at the front, the mantua was gradually draped back over the hips to reveal the petticoat, an underskirt of canvas or linen with inserted rings made of whalebone or cane. The hoop took on several silhouettes, becoming wide and flat towards the middle of the century. Very broad gowns like this, example from 1753, were preserved for formal occasions. When women wearing the mantua were obliged to slide sideways through doors, 1720 to 1770, mantuas and open robes. Throughout most of the 18th century, there were several basic staples. Open robe, a separate skirt known as a petticoat, was worn beneath stiffened panel known as a stomacher. Robings, the folded back edges of the gown. Fashion for the most formal occasions was set at the French court. 
of King Louis XV and copied throughout Europe, especially a particular style known as Le Grand Habit, heavily bone bodice and a separate richly decorated skirt and train. 1778 to 1789, French a la mode. Towards the end of the 18th century, people of fashion looked to France for the latest word on matters of taste and clothing and manners and cultural trends. The styles of the age included tightly waisted bodices and draped and padded skirts. The fashion icon during this time was Marie Antoinette. By 1820, the dresses once again began to spread outward and instead the hemline shortened. The hems on the dresses were also usually adorned with trims and embellishments. The new crinoline frame provided relief from wearing multi-layered petticoats, but its buoyancy meant that long cotton drawers were now essential under linens. In the 1860s, an oval frame shape evolved and box pleated skirts gave way to gourd panels which provided a smooth fit over the frame. Bodices and skirts were separate items, allowing for alternative styles of bodice and front closure for convenience. Large frames were abandoned after 1867 skirts trail and were gathered up internally with ties, forming a soft bustle. Then crinolettes and bustle pads took over. Designer icon. Known as the father of hoop couture, Frederick Charles Worth was a key designer of this period. In my fashion history course in Ladycloth U on Teachable, I go into more detail about Charles Worth and other key designers in dressmaking and fashion design. Soft bustles and fishtails. 1870 to 1879. This page depicts the bustle style that was very popular during this time. By the 1880s, the fishtail portion of the bustle was out of fashion. Around the 1870s to 1900s, the skirts returned to a fuller but more functional style. Believe it or not, these dresses were considered sportswear. Nineteen thirty to nineteen forty four, femininity and romance reemerged during this period as the bodice skirt style returned, although the silhouettes are more A line and soft than before. In my fashion illustration course on Lady Clock U on Teachable, I go over the various silhouettes in dressmaking which are essential to know. Nineteen forty seven to nineteen fifty five. With the end of World War II, French haute couture designer Christian Dior introduced New Look. In Dior's first collection, it marked a change of shapes from previous decades. The collection launched in February 1947, included rounded or sloped shoulders, tiny waist achieved via short corsets and other undergarments, padded and rounded hips, very full skirt with heavy pleating, extra fabric, and a slip to help the skirt's fullness. Couture gowns, typically worn to balls and grand occasions by the wealthy elite, who couture evening gowns were the ultimate expression of couture house art. They were bold and dramatic and intended to draw the attentions to the wearer. Designers used the finest fabric and the most intricate techniques to create them. Best known were French designers Christian Dior, Pierre Balmain, Hubert de Givenchy, Spanish designer Cristobal Balenciaga, the American based Charles James. While based on a runway model, a gown could be customized to the needs of a client for a specific event. The new look silhouette emphasized the hourglass figure with its narrow waist. Skirts were usually full, though the columnar sheath also grew popular. Here we see the evolution of women's style over the last 3,000 years, the ball gown having its pinnacles. However, even today, its influence has not waned they are still requested for the grandest of occasions. Called ball for its shape as where it was often worn to, I don't see this princess silhouette going anywhere anytime soon.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Videos are uploaded weekly covering dressmaking, fashion, lectures, and more. Enroll in Lady Cloth U on Teachable for dressmaking and fashion design courses. See you again soon.